Well, uh, 2021 has been a hoot, very choppy. Uh, 2020, it was clearly uh, a good year. And many of us are wondering, uh, roaring 20s, you gonna start anytime soon? Well, there's some things that we gotta get out of the way. So, uh, this is gonna be a tough one. I'm Mark Monroe, and this is a breakdown of quantitative easing and what to expect moving after we come to that end. Cue the intro. So what made the stock market really go boom in 2020 and also still go on this, you know, choppy run to the upside? What caused that? I'll keep it simple for you. Quantitative easing. So quantitative easing is pretty much where you have your central bank, AKA the Fed, they're going to create money. It's an exorbitant amount of money, they're gonna print money. And then from there, what they're going to do is they're going to literally start buying up with that new money that they just created. They're gonna buy up a lot of mortgage-backed securities, so a lot of mortgage debt, and then on top of that, other treasuries. So that way, essentially, they're taking that away from banks. They're taking that risk off of the table. Now that you have all these banks that are now flush with cash, what must they do? Those banks are now going to have to go through this process of literally lending money. So they lend money out to individuals, consumers, along with businesses. Now, why do we do that? When you lend it out, and when the lending becomes so openly available, at the same time that this is happening, interest rates are dropping. So if you notice back in 2020, we saw interest rates literally go from, I think about 3% or two and a half percent or something like that. We went all the way down close to zero. I think we came all the way to about quarter of a percent or 1.15% in interest rates. So we've completely dropped. Now, the thing about that is, is that now it's like, okay, well, if bonds are no longer the place to be or the finding a yield within these areas are the place to be, well, where else am I going to find yield, AKA profit? Keep this in mind. When bonds are bought, then yields come down. But when bonds are sold, yields go up. Yields are the reflection of the profitability from say, for example, potential profitability return from those bonds. So if you're buying up a bond, you're buying it at a certain yield. But then after a while, when there's X amount of buyers that are now flooded there, then essentially what happens next is, you guessed it, then essentially we see interest rates or interest yields go down. So you see this happen within the 10 year and the 30 year, but really the 10 year is the benchmark across not only the United States, but UK and you know Germany and so on and so on. Now that interest rates have dropped, so now it's like completely like, okay, hey, well, banks have got to do something in order to stay alive because they mostly live off of interest rates and other packages, but mostly interest rates, especially when we think about borrowing. So now that you can literally start sending tons of cash into the market, what happens? Well, you guessed it, people start to spend. So businesses start to make investments, consumers, they start spending money as it pertains to within the open marketplace. And ultimately the economy is now stimulated. Now there's a specific dance that you have to do because you don't want the market to get too overheated to the point where we go through a deflationary period. And you don't want that to happen because then essentially it's like it becomes a little bit out of control. So now you have the Fed bringing you up to speed of where we are today. When we hear all these phrases about tapering and say for example, interest rates preparing to go up for a hike, that's pretty much saying that, okay, hey, we brought in so much stimulus into the market. The market's starting to react and we're starting to see things get a little bit hot on the inflationary point. So now it's like, we've done our job. Now it's time for us to start backing off. Now, nobody knows specifically when we've seen that the, we've seen that the Fed has made this mandate of saying that, hey, we're watching the unemployment, the job markets, and some other few markets as it pertain, but mostly looking at the labor markets to use those as strong benchmarks. I don't think that any Fed ever gets it right. I mean, I don't think that it's ever really a perfect science because many times it's based upon the discretion of whoever the Fed chairman is along with their board when it comes to them making a vote. And so here's the part where we find ourselves in somewhat of an influx right now in the market. Because on one side, you have Wall Street saying that, hey, it's time for rate hikes to happen. You've done your job, stimulus has been good, and then now it's like it's time for the market to literally start picking itself up. 
But then on the other side, you had the Fed saying, especially under Chairman Powell, saying that, hey, we don't think so yet. We see inflation a little bit too high, though that we believe that it's slightly transitory. But at the same token, think about the areas in which that we've seen huge inflation, like used cars. Well, the reason why we see that happening is because of the fact that there's other things that have hit the market. So for example, not only did we have the pandemic hit the market, but look at what's happening also in supply chain and logistics, AKA manufacturing, chips. Chips got completely obliterated as it pertains to not being able to meet up with the demand. Now, a part of that is, is that we're getting ready to go through a really big boom, AKA a new industrial revolution, AKA the chip revolution. Ha, ah, we're finally here. Chips rule the world, Skynet, oh. Now we're finding ourselves in the part where we see huge inflation in used cars markets. And then on top of that, when it comes to food. So now it's like, okay, hey, have we really come out of this recession or are we just getting started? And that's really the key question. We have folks on Congress that are really asking those questions now. We also have Wall Street that's really begging to ask that. So how do we know that? So for example, we just saw a huge sell-off in bonds. In the bond market, we saw a huge sell-off. So now we've seen inflationary uh, start to hit, which is an indicator because of the fact that everybody's watching the 10-year treasury yield. So now we see it up to about, depending on when you're looking at this video, we see it at about probably, what is it, a 1.5? Now, mind you, the 10-year treasury over periods of time has been about like 3% at 3%, but now we're at 1.5. So it goes to show you that we probably still have a long way to go. But it also, here's another thing. If you look at the treasury, the 10-year treasury yield, we've been technically on a downward decline since really the 1980s. I mean, I think the 1980s and 1990s was really when it was at its best. And then after that, it's like, you know, the 10 year treasury or just treasury yields have just been on a downward decline ever since getting their few spikes here and there, but still on a downcline. Um, so now we're at a point where is it time for the Fed to let go of the to let go of the reins and really let the market start to do its thing? Well, we're going to start seeing that because soon the Fed is going to make its announcement of them tapering. So what does it mean when they start tapering? That means that they start shaving off how much that they're buying. So they start tapering back and stop buying back mortgage-backed securities along with other treasuries. Now, this is gonna take some time. They just don't do that like a snap of the finger. But what's going to happen is over a period of time, they're going to get to a certain rate and they're looking for a specific inflationary rate. So typically they say about 2% is their inflationary rate. And then essentially then from there, it's like, okay, hey, the, the markets are pretty much out of normal. But if the markets run too hot, that could be a problem because essentially we do see wages growing, but then at the same token, we don't see people literally going to jobs as fast. So there's still a lot of folks out there that are unemployed, especially people who look like us. So that's something to keep in mind. Now we're at this point where the economy has now had all the stimulus. Does it need more stimulus or does it have more than enough? Well, in 2022, or technically before the end of 2021, before this year comes to its end, we're probably going to see a tapering start. So either an announcement in November, and then essentially we start to taper in December, or essentially we'll hear the announcement in December, and then the tapering starts in January. One way or another, that's going to be the outcome. And then after that, we're probably going to see about a quarter of a percent rate hike. Now, of course, when rates go up, then ultimately that's another thing where in the market's starting to kind of price in which has made the market a little bit volatile because the market is saying that, okay, hey, if we see interest rates going up, all those great companies, especially those growth stocks, start to look somewhat vulnerable. Why? Because we talk about deferred cash flow or deferred revenue, or say, for example, future revenues can be hit, which can also hurt pro profit margins in the future. So profit margins are pretty much after you've made something, then you sold it, and then essentially you get the profit back, then that's the margin afterwards. So that can hurt margins um, and investors don't really like that. But I mean, in my opinion, I think that a lot of these tech companies are going to be just fine because think about it. They were still doing just well when we saw the 10 year at 3%. And then on top of that, we had other types of inflationary moments. When we saw the tapering in 2013, 2014, we saw a lot of scare. But in the end, it was like, OK, well, what were we crying about? And remember, a lot of times people like to refer back to previous dates but every situation is different. 
In 2013, 2014, it was the economy trying to come back from, say, for example, one of the biggest financial crises that we've had in our history. This time we're going through a pandemic that was worse than polio. So now we're sitting at a precipice now of what is the Fed's move? And now this is where the game gets a little bit more strategic, more like a game of chess, because now it's gonna be, is the Fed right? Is the market right? Who's right? Or are they both right or are they both wrong? We won't know these things until we see them play out, but I would definitely be watching, say for example, a few things. I would be watching job growth, I will be watching GDP numbers, and I will also be watching unemployment and inflation. Those are the four things that you need to be paying attention to. Is the economy getting better or is the economy just sitting there stagnant? If we're seeing the economy sit there stagnant, but yet at the same token, all these opportunities are coming about, then we could be probably in the midst of a recession because then that means that if GDP growth is down and we're not growing as fast as we should, then we're definitely in a recession. If we're in, say, for example, a period where we start seeing this huge economic boom, which a lot of folks are expecting us to hit sooner or later, then that means that essentially that we're coming out of a recession and you're gonna probably start seeing more investors go risk on. So what looks attractive right now? Well, currently right now, when people are a little bit spooked, they start to look at things in which that are financials because of interest rates. They start to look at other things like, for example, utilities, consumer staples, and then on top of that, they start to look at things like energy. So those are the things that have been hot topic items this year alongside with industrials. So value stocks start to look attractive. But if we start noticing that we're getting to a place where people are realizing that, hey, it's not all doom and gloom like everybody is saying within the market, then that allows people to come back to having a little bit more risk, which turns from value based investing to looking more so at the growth stock companies, aka your tech consumer discretionary and those types of sectors. So all in all, pay attention because now we're at this point in time where the quantitative easing is going to stop. And it's not gonna stop abruptly, like I said, but it's gonna start tapering back. So pay attention, be focused, and essentially from here on out, definitely figure out exactly what is it that you want in your portfolio so that way you can have a little bit of risk, but also have something in portfolio management that you can also protect yourself from any potential downside risk. So you'll hear about people buying bonds, value stocks, or say for example, even looking at crypto, or I guess some folks do look at gold and silver. Um, if you have any of these questions and you wanna look further in depth, please consult with a financial advisor, somebody who's FINRA certified and also board certified and is a certified fiduciary, because they can definitely give you some wonderful help. Until next time, I'm Mark Monroe, and this has been your come up. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.